Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the moderator for this session, Dr. Alan Gutmacher. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to what is going to be a quite interesting discussion, and I emphasize it's going to be a discussion. The three of us up here on the stage are going to speak briefly, but most of the hour will be spent fielding questions, comments, ideas, back and forth with all of you in the audience. Uh, much like the later working groups later this morning, which will be even more interactive in terms of what we're doing. We're here this morning to talk about opportunities ahead harnessing the power of scientific discovery and technology innovation. The reason for doing this really, if one thinks about the scientific discovery of the last 20 years, there are many ways to think about it. But one of them is we used to have this argument particularly about childhood, but life in general, is it nurture or is it nature? And clearly what the science of the last 20 years, and you could say most of the biological and developmental science of the last 20 years has been about showing it's neither, that it is both. It is nurture and nature working together to make us the humans that we are. And as we think about improving the lot of children, we need to think about how do we harness that kind of science. In a kind of parallel way, there are sort of two threads to think about that and two that are emerging simultaneously now. One of them are new technologies of which we're going to hear a lot this morning. And the other is using those new technologies in community-based ways that really take into account the reality of the lives of all children in the United States, in Canada, and in fact across the world. So what we're going to try to get into a bit this morning in the panel is really exploring with you what some of those new technologies, what some of the new approaches are, both in terms of really, gee whiz, unbelievable, Buck Rogers, futuristic, but the future is now kinds of tools, but also some w ways of thinking about how down on the ground do we really implement those things so they're to the benefit of all children, not just some. And that's really what we're going to explore together, the three of us. Let me quickly introduce the three folks you see sitting up here. I'm Alan Guttmacher, as the voice of God told you a little bit earlier. Uh, I uh, am recently retired from the National Institutes of Health, where I was for 16 or 17 years. About a decade of that is the deputy director and acting director of what's called the National Human Genome Research Institute, which brought you the Human Genome Project, amongst other things. And then the last half dozen years as the director of the National Institute of Child uh, of child health and human development, how quickly they forget, uh, which is the locus at NIH for most of the things we're talking about today in terms of child health, child development, et cetera. I'm currently the senior advisor of the Permanent Fund for Vermont's Children, which I'll tell you a little bit about a little bit later in the program. Joining me starting the other end, as you'd be able to figure out, is Daniel Kraft. Um, Daniel has been a real leader in developing the kinds of new technologies in health that we really will be talking about this morning. If you read his full bio, uh, I would do that, but we don't have time for me to read his full bio. Uh, but among the fairly amazing number of hats that he has, and most of them still wears, he is the faculty chair for medicine and neuroscience at Singularity University. He's also founder and chair of Exponential Medicine. Margaret Laws, next on the panel, is the president and CEO of Hope Lab where she, uh, and previously as well at the California Healthcare Foundation, has been a real leader in bringing together governmental, uh, nonprofit, and private sector stakeholders to advance the use of technology in improving health and well-being with a particular focus on children, young adults, and underserved populations. Unfortunately, due to travel delays, there would have been a fourth chair up here, and Shu Lee, who is the scientific director of the Institute of Human Development, Child and Youth Health, Canadian Institutes of Health, could not join us today, but we had discussed both the three of us together, me singularly with Shu earlier, some of the themes that he wanted to bring up, and we will bring them up a little bit later in the discussion. Quickly how this will work, uh, Daniel and Mark will each speak to you for about 12 minutes or so about some of the things they are doing, some of the ideas they thought you should be aware of, and then we will have this interactive, I'll say something very briefly about the kinds of things that she wanted to talk about, and then we will have the interactive discussion for the rest of the hour. So let's get started. Daniel, you're up. All right. Fantastic. Well, a real honor and privilege to be here as a pediatrician as well. And I want to 
only in 12 minutes, really quickly across the spectrum of health and technology, how it might impact the future of children and pediatrics. So I'm, I'm lucky to actually be in the first class of Aspen Institute Health Innovators Fellows, so I get to come here every year or so. Um, but what I want to talk about briefly now is help you frame a little bit about where technologies are, where they're heading, and how that might impact uh, health, children's health and across the whole healthcare spectrum, from keeping kids healthy and active uh, to the future of better diagnostics, more precise therapies, a bit about democratizing and globalizing uh, health impacts for kids and beyond, and a bit about discovery, how can we speed up clinical trials and beyond. So a bit of framing before we dive into some of the technologies. First of all, in our healthcare systems, particularly in the United States, we're really doing more sick care than health care. The data that we get from our kids and adults is very intermittent. A blood pressure check occasionally, a range from EKG, uh, you may have uh, diabetes and faxing in blood sugar numbers to your endocrinologist. So the data is intermittent, often siloed, hard to access, and we're quite reactive, whether we wait for the heart attack or the stroke, or I'm a pediatric oncologist, often patients presenting with late stage disease. And I think an overall premise about where technology can take health and medicine and pediatrics and child health is to be much more continuous with our data and then much more proactive, not waiting uh, for obesity or other elements uh, to evolve and sort of uh, moving the needle back uh, to earlier stages when we have smart data. And while technology, which I'll dive into, is certainly super important, I think the opportunity we have today is to look at where the incentives are and the policies, because we're still mostly doing fee-for-service medicine in the United States uh, and practicing not uh, uh, evidence-based medicine, but reimbursement-based medicine. As we can shift the equation to rewarding smart, proactive care in kids and adults, we can shift that needle. So of course, we're now in 2017. It's in a pretty amazing era. Just, just 10 years ago, the first iPhone launched, only 10 years ago this month. And think how much the world's changed just with these amazing technologies in our pockets for kids and adults. Actually, I actually have an antique. It's my iPhone 2. It still works. Um, it used to feel magical. Now it feels slow and clunky. But these, of course, are changing healthcare and are impacting our kids' brains and our brains in sometimes good and bad ways. And since I come from Silicon Valley, here's a sneak peek at the iPhone 10 and the iPhone 11. Um, <laughs> but of course, these are healthcare technologies riding in exponential ways. Moore's law, the power of exponentials, it's getting about a billion times cheaper and more powerful than a supercomputer in the 1970s. Uh, and exponentials are all around us, not just with Moore's law. So one of my takeaways for you this, in this short talk is to become exponential thinkers, see where the puck is going. Um, realizing that now from exponentials, we have the desktop of 2000, fits in our smartphone, now fits in our smart watch. We now have tablets on sale in the developing world for $25 that can change kids' education and, and access to healthcare information and beyond. And now, of course, these smart computers are shrinking. We have computers the size of a grain of rice, which are becoming connected. You, you've heard of the Internet of Things. We're now in the era of Internet of Medical Things. And we're moving from 4G soon to 5G, which will be 100 times faster than our current systems. So lots of things are moving very quickly. And that's often bringing us this new world of connected health or mobile health or, or digital health, kind of buzzwordy. But it does bring us the opportunity to bring data together and access and impact in new and smart ways. And we need to sort of study the impact of these elements. And it's not just you know, Moore's Law and smartphone technology. It's the convergence of everything from big data, and machine learning, and 3D printing, and nanotech, and VR, all coming together that I think enables us to rethink elements of children's health across the spectrum, from cost to demographics to access to care to what do we do with all the big data to make it actionable for the parent or the pediatrician. How do we unfragment the information, share it between children's hospitals and EMRs and pharma companies, even help our friends at the F or the FDA speed up regulation, and our friends at the payers reward smart impact for kids and beyond. You know, simple problems like access to care. Very few pediatric psychiatrists, for times hundreds of thousands of miles. So lots of opportunities to reimagine health and medicine. We can take sometimes, uh, you know, examples from the Bay Area, reimagination like Uber. You know, it's an exponential company. It couldn't have existed uh, 10 years ago, but they connected the dots between smartphones and data and payments and cars. It's disrupted the travel world to the point where uh, in Austin they've outlawed it. Or even uh, Ubers themselves are disrupting their own field by self-driving Ubers. So the future of driving and work is a big issue. Um, even Uber Health, pioneered in Boston, is uh, using platforms to press a button and bring a nurse or doctor to give a, a flu shot to a patient. So lots of new platforms coming to level, riding exponentials. If you're not paying a, ex uh, attention to exponentials, however, you could potentially be the next Kodak. They actually invented digital photography, didn't pay attention to its impact, and they were bankrupt five years ago, and Instagram, which all our kids are now on, sold for a billion dollars. So uh, they had their Kodak moment. That's coming to, to many fields, uh, to insurance, uh, to the world of uh, pharma, uh, and of one therapies. Uh, uh, so the, the takeaway in any field you're in is to Uber yourself before you get Kodak. All right. So, 
I get a lens of this, uh, you know, sharing medicine at something called Singularity University, where we look at the power of exponentials to impact big challenges from poverty, education, and healthcare. And because health and medicine is such a team sport, but it's very rare that you have an integration of different fields. I founded a program six years ago called Exponential Medicine. We have faculty and alumni in the room here. It's pretty magical when you bring folks together from all sorts of fields together for four days to rethink where technology is heading. So some of you might want to join us next fall. Okay, let's dive into four quick areas. Health and prevention, particularly in children. Now, we know it's, our genetics are important, but it's really our behaviors, particularly early in life, that drive most of our long-term costs. So if we can impact our bad behaviors, particularly in kids, we can probably abrogate our big healthcare costs and chronic and other diseases and beyond. And now we're, you know, we can start to measure that. How many, how many of you are, are, are you wearing a Fitbit this morning? I've got 12 versions on today. Um, <laughs> most of you have one in your drawer, right? This is coming to measure not just our sleep and our steps, but all sorts of elements. And it's coming to our kids as well, for, for better or for worse. And the opportunity is to take this data, not just for data geeks to have it silent on our phones, but to connect it to our healthcare systems, to our pediatricians, to our public health elements, to go to quantified self, with, from quantified self to quantified health. So glucometers for kids with diabetes that can talk to your smartphones, from, to incitables and contact lenses that Google's now working with to bring diabetics uh, data, to incitables, devices underneath the skin that can transmit blood glucose and movement and blood oxygenation. So lots of elements are getting smaller and cheaper and can be used in interesting ways. Even to the idea of trainables, you know, your digital mother isn't always there to remind you to stand up straight. There's now whole new technologies you put on your back and it nudges you to stand up straight, can impact back pain. Um, uh, shockables, Pavlov was on something. Hearables, you know, uh, not just for hearing aids or for music, but they can track your steps and activity. Ringables, this ring tracks my sleep, something really important in kids and adolescents we don't often get enough of. That can be measured and hopefully tweaked. Um, brushables, oral health, all these things are coming around. The trick is we don't want to have our kids or ourselves wearing 12 devices. We need to start integrating them in smart ways and bringing them together for you know, pregnant women. Last trimester, you can measure the health of the mother and the health of the fetus and when it's time to go to the hospital with contractions. And when that bundle of joy is born, this used to be a joke from Wired Magazine, you know, the connected diaper. Mm -hmm. The future's coming faster than you think. Huggies came out with Tweet Pee. You can figure out what that one does. There's data for number two as well, right? So all sorts of new ways we can measure our kids, um, from connected onesies to teddy bears that enable them to be censored at home. So maybe we can send kids home from the NICU and pick you a day or two early. Here's my son, Leo, doing his part for medicine. He doesn't need to wear that to let me know he's waking up every two hours as a newborn. But we can use these in smart new ways, whether it's striking temperature or milk or baby monitoring. The trick is it can be overwhelming for the parent, the pediatrician, the whole industry. We need to be smart about integrating this data because now our Wi-Fi can measure vital signs of up to 10 people in the room at the same time. And we're soon going to be always online with healthcare data. So it's a bit of a so what, unless that data can flow from your home, from your sensors, to your pediatrician. So the data is actionable, not just overwhelming information, that we can align the incentives to prescribe devices and wearables when it makes sense. We're starting to see that happen. HealthKit now data can flow into my EMR at Stanford. My doctor can see my data. And no pediatrician or otherwise wants to look at Fitbit data. We want to integrate this, almost like, a, an on, uh, like the check engine light of our cars. Our cars have hundreds of sensors. We don't care about any one data point. We want to see the integration of that, kind of like the OnStar systems, which you can use for kids and adults to bring that together. We can use coaching in smart ways uh, for, our, for ourselves, for our kids. Uh, Chatbots are now here that can remind you to get more activity or more sleep and talk to you in empowering ways. Our connected homes are already here. You know, Boston Children's launched KidsMD on Amazon Echo that can help dose Tylenol or uh, how to manage asthma in your children. So these smart coaches will be ubiquitous in our morning mirrors. Uh, you'll see yourself of today, but you also might see you of tomorrow. That may change your perception if you're working out, et cetera, or if you keep giving your kids donuts, you of tomorrow, right? That can be a powerful lever, seeing yourself before, after donuts, right? <laughs> or if your kids are smoking, what is their face gonna look like? Before smoking, after smoking, if you can show that to them on their own faces, very powerful levers, or too much time on Facebook, which we'll talk about, is another issue. And that brings another technology, augmented reality, right? It's already been here. Things like Google Glass have not been a great consumer hit, but they're being used in the clinic or for kids with autism to learn how to interact with their um, mothers and emotions and learn better emotional intelligence. So lots of ways uh, um, VR and AR are coming, including educating our medical students and nurses and parents to, to learn anatomy and other things in smart ways. So lots of platforms are emerging, um, including you know, educating our kids. This is blended reality. My kids got this t-shirt. You can see inside your virtual body Body this way. Uh, so it's very engaging for children to learn early about their health, their impact of uh, what's happening to their lungs and their heart. My son Leo now knows his heart and lungs at, at, at three years old. So new ways of understanding data, making healthcare fun like Pokemon Go, 
VR used to be expensive. Now you can do it with your smartphone. It's being used for kids in scary environments or for children getting burn injuries to be in cold environments and, and play uh, with snowballs and lower their opiate needs and burn injuries. Or at Stanford running out the um, Stanford Heart for pediatricians and others to learn tetralogy flow and other complicated diseases. So the future of medical education is being blended by these sorts of technologies. So just a few examples. Of course, genomics just mentioned. The price of sequencing has dropped from a million dollars a few years ago at twice the rate of Moore's Law, down, down, down to about $1,000. Soon every kid will be sequenced at birth. What are the implications for that to, to tuning, screening, and behavior? The microbiome, something we're understanding now. You can get your own microbiome done for $80. We're starting to crowdsource that and understand its ability to be used in therapeutics or as well as its role in obesity. Uh, we're willing to do uh, uh, microbiome transplants after C-sections, for example. Um, so lots of things are coming in that space. What about maintaining our kids' brains? Meditation and yoga can be taught for almost free. Their impacts on our brains are very positive. We can use consumer technologies like brain-computer interfaces to prescribe meditation to kids or adults, or to treat kids with ADHD, for example. So bottom line is some of these consumer devices can be used to impact brains in positive ways as well. Um, and video games are coming uh, for therapy for autism and ADHD. Last two minutes, diagnostics. We now have a whole new set of digital tools we can have in our pocket for doing the you know, digital otoscope exam. So instead of bringing your child into the pediatrician, you can do that virtually. Is the pediatrician going to be reimbursed for that? Are they incentivized to use these systems? Big issues. All these tools are coming into our pockets, can enabling us to do AI-enhanced diagnostics, whether it's for a melanoma, uh, or to do eye exams or the back of the eye. Uh, it's going to be disruptive to the world of pathology, dermatology, radiology, where we can now see computers out of Google do better jobs with, than pathologists with unlimited time. Or to do advanced cardiac diagnostics in kids with congenital abnormalities and send that data right back to the iPad of the patient. So lots of technologies are converging. And in diagnostics, we can do it for kids with facial abnormalities, understanding and diagnosing early uh, for impact. One thing that's interesting, I've been involved with the XPRIZE for many years, is developing home tools for our parents to do basically medical tricorders. Hold the technology to forehead, pulls down temperature, heart rate, O2 stat. Lots of things we can have in our pocket that can be democratizing healthcare. Or a urinary test that you dip uh, your urine dipstick and do the exam on your, on your smartphone to save uh, uh, time, money, and access. So lots of things are coming. We need to connect the dots. More data isn't better. We need intelligence-based medicine. And I don't think it will be AI, but intelligence augmentation, which will augment our pediatricians and parents and hopefully better connect uh, uh, the future. It's not human versus a machine. I'm out of time. So in 30 seconds, therapy. Lots of things coming down from better ways to track when we give medications to CRISPR that's moving very quickly to cure diseases like sickle cell and thalassemia in kids to cure them for their entire life. Uh, coming to immunotherapy, as we'll hear more about today. Prescribing apps for all sorts of elements from diabetes to hacking uh, glucometers for kids uh, to, to manage di type 1 diabetes. The digital checkup is here. All sorts of ways we're going to be blending this future using technology in smart ways. Chat bots for our kids to be interacting on Facebook uh, with their data. 3D printing coming for our kids to make prosthetics or replace casts with ones that are personalized to them. Lots of things are moving. I'm going to skip all these. Just to mention that 3D printing is here for prosthetics to uh, devices for, uh, uh, for global health. All these things, in summary, can enable us to reimagine children's health around the planet, giving access to data. Soon everyone won't have an SMS phone, they'll have smartphones. We're being opening up internet with Google Loon to 3 billion people on the planet in the next few years. And then we can and then deliver them to care with drones in hard to reach access places of America or uh, Haiti after an earthquake. So many technologies coming to bear. All this in sum can help us reimagine the future of discovery in our kids and beyond to download clinical trials that we can all use ourselves today to crowdsource this future. Just like what we drive today, 10 years ago we had paper maps. The future I think will be the symbol of Google Maps for Health where we all donate some data from our kids and our adults and our public health systems to build those healthcare maps. And we call and all of them be not organ donors, uh, but data donors as we move forward. So the future of health in kids, I think, is the convergence of all these exponential technologies. We can use them to think not about where we are in 2017, but where the puck is going to be, as Wayne Gretzky says, in 2020 and 2025. And if I think we do that, we can stimulate new inventions. I just emceed Impact Pediatric Health, or we're seeing new folks like PEACE 2040 and iSpy networks come together to foster innovation in healthcare. And we can move from this era of intermittent, reactive, siloed sick care to a true way of continuous and proactive healthcare for our children and beyond. So with that, let's not take linear steps. Let's move forward with exponential ones for our children. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much, Daniel. And while we're waiting for the folks from, uh, <laughs> to authenticate this, we think we just set the world record for the most slides, most slides. in a 12-minute talk. So you were there. You can tell your, et cetera. Thank you very much. That was great, really inspiring.
Margaret, you're up. So I'm going to kick off by saying now you know a little bit about what it feels like to live in Silicon Valley. So we are, <laughs> uh, and, and I don't mean just, Daniel is, is amazing, but, but it's all there. It's out there, and there are a million solutions. Uh, and so one of the, the really interesting things about being here today is that this is an audience of children's hospital uh, people, people very engaged in improving children's health, and philanthropists. And Hope Lab, the organization that I run, was started by a philanthropist with a really deep passion for children's health. So this is Pam Omidyar, wife of eBay founder Pierre Omidyar. And Pam uh, and Pierre uh, made a substantial sum from eBay and made a decision that they were going to spend this money doing things to try to improve the world. And they work in many, many different areas, but one of them was to start Hope Lab, a real passion of Pam's, to try to use science and technology to dramatically improve and measurably improve children's health and well-being. And so I want to tell the genesis story of Hope Lab because it's a really interesting one and it, it feeds into the way we try to take this incredible world of technology and actually bring it, to Alan's point, down on the ground um, so that we can get it out into the lives of people, particularly underserved communities. So Pam was working in a lab, and they were pondering this, this really vexing question, which is why do kids who are going through cancer treatment not take their full courses of chemo um, and antibiotics? If you, take, if you miss only 20% of your doses of chemo, you can have a, a 2x uh, chance of cancer recurring. And yet this was happening a lot. Pam was also a gamer. She played video games. And so one night when she was playing a game, she, had, she asked herself this question, which is, is there something in the experience of a game that could really help solve this problem of kids not taking these drugs. And so I, I like to start with this slide, which was her question, you know, can a video game help cure cancer? And people thought she was crazy. Um, but she was really passionate about it. She was passionate about making change for kids and young people, and she was passionate about ways technology could be used for good. And so um, as Hope Lab has evolved, we were talking about this as really deeply based in science, in, uh, in showing impact, but also with uh, driven by heart and compassion. And the process that we used then and continue to use, I want to walk through really quickly. And then what I'm going to do is just take you through a few projects and talk about how we're trying to bring technology with a very, very deep human element out into the world to try to improve uh, kid, health for kids and young adults. So the way we think about this process or this sort of um, prescription is we think about a health behavior to the point that Daniel just made, health behavior that either needs to change or promoting a positive health behavior. And we deeply study and understand the psychology behind that health behavior. What is the psychology of why a kid wouldn't take chemo meds? Um, well, it feels like their enemy. It reminds them that they're sick. Um, they don't feel power. And so then we think about, well, how might we use technology as a tool, not as a solution, but as a tool to act on that psychology and to help that person, that child in this case, get to a place where they actually feel like the chemo is their weapon or their, their power and feel like they do have power. So this uh, first product that Hope Lab created, the thing that Hope Lab was created to, to build was a video game called Remission for kids with cancer. Remission was the first video game to go through a randomized controlled trial. It showed statistically significant um, results in improving, um, improving kids' outcomes, taking the chemo, taking the antibiotics, and having optimal cancer outcomes. And it, uh, what was also interesting about it was we did fMRI studies and showed that there was a difference between just being shown the information or given the information and actually playing the game, that the agency and the power of playing the game and of controlling this nanobot through a, a journey through the body and blasting cancer cells activated these motivation centers. So what Hope Lab did was tried to take the learnings from that and deal with a broader problem. Thankfully, not that many kids have cancer. So there was a real interest from the part of our funders and board to take it to a bigger problem. So we looked at the challenge of initially diabetes and then childhood obesity and created, and this is to remind, remind you about 10 years ago. So the things that you've seen that Daniel just showed are obviously the, the uh, sequelae of this work that was done. First meter um, that could capture bursts of activity that might be dancing or quicker bursts of activity that kids might engage in. And basically what Zamzi was, was a product that was an activity tracker and a, and a game or an activity platform for kids um, to, to basically work on getting more physical activity in the interest of being healthier generally, but in the broader interest of, of pediatric obesity. So a real prevention-focused um, intervention. 
Zamzi increased physical activity in kids by 59% on average, very significant. This was also done in randomized controlled trials. So Hope Lab continued this effort to try to basically be a lab where we could take challenges for kids' health and put together novel, innovative approaches and study them with scientific rigor. Um, I came on to Hope Lab about two years ago, and one of the challenges that was put to me by the board, and I think a really important one for all of us and for our discussion over the next two days, was these things are great. It's great to show in a lab or in a small controlled trial that you can get things to work, but what we really need is to create or adapt or promote solutions that can be broadly adopted in the system, the healthcare system, the education system, the broader system of care. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do over the past couple of years is really develop a strategy for uh, developing and promoting these technologies, but at scale. So one example I'm going to talk about is an organization many of you are familiar with, the Nurse Family Partnership. NFP works with first-time teen and young adult moms, pairs them with a nurse who starts with them when they're at 28 weeks of pregnancy or earlier and continues with them for the first two years of their lives. 40-year-old program, incredible evidence, incredible return on investment, um, really a wonderful program. But the program deals, it, it's, its clients are teens and young adults, and there was no technology, no digital element to the program. So we, in, in collaboration with Nurse Family Partnership, which serves more than 30,000 families a year, so in each of those families you have a, young, a teen or young adult mom and a baby, so you're getting a twofer. Um, we really looked at this question of how might technology deeply, deeply integrated with a very human element be brought to bear to make this program more scalable, more engaging, and really more relevant to today's young digital native moms. So we've been working with Nurse Family Partnership for about a year and a half, really amazing project where we've done deep human-centered design work. We've been out in the field with young moms, with nurses, with the, um, with the uh, administrative folks, and we've uh, worked with them to develop what takes the form of an app, but I, I don't want to to talk about an app as a solution here. It's really a tool for the nurses and the moms to use together to set goals and to work through the program in a way that we hope will make it available to more young moms who need it and will make the, um, will make the impact of the program as, as uh, strong as possible. We really looked at the psychology of what it is that helps young women get through this program effectively and the ability to set and track and work towards gold, to be empowered and to really take charge of life, much like the kids with cancer, um, is, is really an important piece of it. So a little bit on, on how we're working with NFP, how we're bringing technology to bear. Very, very integrated with the, the human touch element of the nurse. The second area, uh, we're working in is with adolescents and young adults with cancer. Um, adolescents and young adults with cancer have not seen the progress in outcomes that kids or adults have. And there's all sorts of hypotheses about the state of adolescence and why that might be. But one of the th things that we wanted to do was really, really deeply understand the experience of adolescents going through cancer treatment and cancer survivorship. And so our project there, again, has involved understanding the psychology, deep listening and other human-centered design activities. We, we show here at the Stupid Cancer Conference a group of our staff working with a group of young people and really engaging those young people to help us design and get out into the market solutions and tools that can help them um, maintain their sense of purpose, connect with others who've been through what they've, they've been through before, um, any number of things. But we're really working with these young people to define what those concepts are, and then we'll build chatbots, app solutions, whatever those solutions are that can help bring that to life. And we've been actively engaged with um, and want to engage with more children's hospital, adolescent, young adult, cancer centers as our partners in getting this out into the market. Finally, the final area that we're tackling right now is um, teen and young adult mental and emotional health. Lots of statistics here. You guys are probably familiar with many of them. But this year's college age youth, lots of anxiety and depression, binge drinking and drug use as a result of that, um, and a lot of attempted and, and actualized suicide. And so the process that we're going through here is to step back and really try to understand the system, the system that exists around mental and emotional health of teens and young adults. Again, we're engaging providers, payers, academics, advocates, young people to understand what that map looks like and then see where the leverage points are, where, um, in our case, technology-enabled solutions might help, 
where those link with policy efforts and trying to, to both bring together a broad community of interest to tackle this um, challenge, but also for us to think as Hope Lab, as a social innovation lab, as a philanthropically funded lab, where can we do some really innovative work to try to help move this field forward? And how can we find partners out there in, as I said, providers, payer systems, others who really deeply care about improving uh, care for mental and emotional health for young people and just don't have the solutions. I'll back up and say that I just talked about three areas we're working in. And the reason we picked those three areas as the three initial areas when I came on to Hope Lab was because we were looking for the convergence space in the market of where people are seeing big problems and where they believe they're ready to take action on those problems. So in Nurse Family Partnership, the time around birth in adolescent young adult cancer, really improving cancer outcomes, treatment outcomes for that population, thinking about transitions from pediatric care to adult care more broadly, and then finally in this area of mental and emotional health for young people, um, working with the system to, to try to work with young people and develop solutions that actually work for them. I think what we found in this area is there's a huge amount of interest and there's a lot of acceptance and sort of admission that what we have out there for, for young people right now isn't working. So this is the approach we're trying to take is to use our philanthropic uh, dollars and to use our capabilities, our understanding of psychology, of design, and of technology to try to experiment and try to get some things out and test it in the market. So that's a little bit about the approach we're taking. I want to finish with <laughs> this slide. Oops. Um, one of the things we're doing at the OMIDIAR group is using systems thinking and systems mapping. So we're really trying to bring together a diverse group of stakeholders to understand the map of, in this case, mental and emotional health of kids and young adults, and to then see where there are leverage points for each of us to work. And as I you know, think about this next day and a half, it really seems like a, a, this is an amazing group to, to do something similar. I think we've got an experiment like that going on where we're really understanding the system. And what I hope is that we can find among us collaborations to move forward. Uh, everybody won't work on the same projects, but if we can find nodes where we can work together, I think this is an incredible group to, to move forward. So I'm excited about getting to know many of you over the next day and a half and find collaborators and connect with, with historical collaborators. So thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret, for another great talk. Shuley, if he were here, was particularly going to talk about social issues and child health and well-being and really focusing on how to engage families and how to create community-based programs. So in Shu's absence, I thought I might bring up an example of developing an innovative community-based approach that really does involve families. And I think it continues a theme that Margaret started of how philanthropy and partnership with existing systems really can make a difference in children's lives. This is a story in Vermont, and it's all due to a visionary philanthropist named Rick Davis, who a number of, sort of at the turn of the millennium, decided that he wanted to spend the rest of his life trying to improve the well-being of all children in Vermont, and created a nonprofit to figure out how to do that. Interestingly, after really looking at the reality of kids' lives and looking very much at the science of child development, child health, et cetera, they decided to focus on the childcare experience. Now, why childcare? It's the same, many of you may know Sutton's Law. Willie Sutton, a famous bank robber, was asked, why do you rob banks? And Willie Sutton said, that's because that's where the money is. So in looking at kids' lives in Vermont, if we want to improve them, where are the kids, particularly the zero to five-year-old kids, where are they? They are in childcare. In Vermont, over 70% of kids, zero to five, have all available parents, as we say, in the workforce. So there's some kind of childcare. Nationally in the US, there are 20 billion child hours a year spent in childcare, 20 billion. That's where our children are in the earliest years, the years where it's most important if we want to have impact on lifelong development, but also on live, lifelong health. So the decision was to really focus on the childcare situation and try to make it accessible, affordable, high quality throughout Vermont. 
our latest effort, and what I've really been involved in, is really to test out a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is, well, let me give you a little context for hypothesis. We already know that good child care providers do very good evidence-based work in terms of child development, emotional development, cognitive development, social development. Our hypothesis is that the child care setting is a wonderful platform in which to provide health care. Why health care? Why child, do that in child care? Well, Vermont's a very rural state. Uh, it's so rural that our biggest city, Burlington, while it's grown significantly in the past few years, it's now got a whopping 42,000 people, and it's far and away the biggest city. So it's a rural state. Kids are dispersed all over in small towns. And there are a number of indicators, you've seen some of them, where they do quite well in health, some not so well. So the idea of childcare is that's where the kids are, but also to take advantage of the trusted relationship between the parent and the childcare provider. After all, the parents every day are handing over their children to the childcare providers. And the childcare providers get to see the kids for hundreds of hours a year, much more than we pediatricians who get to see them interacting with other kids, but also get to see the parents hundreds of times a year, even if it's for a brief contact and you know, picking up the kid and dropping them off. So the question is some obvious things like nutrition. Kids are eating lunch there every day, a couple of snacks. Can we improve the nutritional quality? But also, can we use that as a teachable moment for the kids and, in fact, for their parents about better nutrition and help them figure out how to do that in an economical way? The state government of Vermont spends $2 million a year, which in Vermont goes as big money, simply repairing the poor oral health of kids before the age of six. So what about if we just had dental hygienists who made rotating sort of rounds to child care providers going over with the kids bent better dental hygiene? Opioid abuse is a huge issue in Vermont that is across the rural US. So what about the child care provider who is trusted by the parents, who sees the parents every day, who through some of the things that are going on with the kids also gets insights into what might be happening at home? Can we train child care providers to recognize opioid dependence or abuse in parents, and then use that trusting relationship to refer, to talk to the parents, refer them in to people who can actually help them deal with their substance abuse. Same issues of maternal depression, et cetera, et cetera. So we're envisioning a wide, I could go through more things, I, won't, I don't want to take up our valuable time to do that. But those are the kinds of things, if we want to bring our new science, our new approach to what we've learned about kids' lives, to bear on kids, doing that in the real community-based kind of things. And there are other programs like that that are beginning to spring up around the country. So with that, enough from the three of us. We want to hear from you. Questions, ideas, how come we didn't talk about such and such that you're doing at your place that you know is much better than any of the stuff we talked about. Uh, open it up. We have people with mics out there, so everyone will be able to hear your questions, thoughts. Who's going to be the brave? Somebody needs to open the floodgates. Who's going to be the brave person to go first? I know there's some people out there. That well, are. I will start. Okay. While we're waiting Margaret, for some, yes, yes. I want to just start with a reflection and a question for you, because I was having a conversation at breakfast this morning. One of the most remarkable things about working with Nurse Family Partnership has been when you think about going into the home of a, of a family, and particularly of a young mo you know, yeah. mom living yeah. in poverty or yeah. the Vermont yeah scenario you describe. I think one of the most important things about the program, about the relationship between the nurse in this case and the child care provider you describe, is that they're going into settings where if they come in as sort of a traditional mandated reporter, um, the trust won't be there. And so I think that there's something really important about these structures, what the structure NFP has created, the yep. structure you're yep. talking about in this program, that allow for, um, that allow for the fact that you're gonna see what you're gonna see. We know what is there. And that if the approach that we take is to, is to basically focus on criminalization or reporting, mm -hmm. we're not gonna be able to make progress mm -hmm. with the family. Yeah. And that to me is just an interesting uh, thing to think about as we think about these programs that are successful. How do we think about risk and the legal environment yeah. and how do we have enough courage to create programs and to propagate programs that actually to some extent, recognize that if we don't deal with the reality that's there, if we simply 
focus on the criminal aspect of it, we're probably not going to make a lot of progress with it. Yeah, I think absolutely. It's a sort of, in some ways, organic nature of these things that truly are community-based. And it's about the sense of community and people looking out for each other, not looking out at each other, but for each other, working together. And clearly, I mean, being a parent, no matter what your socioeconomic circumstance, et cetera, is an incredibly challenging job. And it's more challenging these days, often when extended family lives someplace else, so you don't have them to rely on. So using trusted folks to do this in a way that it's not going to be about blame, it's going to be about how can we, as a community, as an organization, as a group of individuals, whatever, help you meet this incredible challenge. Also, how can we use the new technologies at the mm -hmm. same time to do that? Some of the things we're talking about can really take advantage both of this very sort of, in some ways, 18th century kind of community-based kind of thing, but without the blame of the 18th century, I absolutely agree. But do that with the 21st century kinds of tools. We have, we have someone over there with a mic. Why don't you say who you are and tell us what you're Okay. Hi, I'm Katie Beckman. I'm from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. And um, my question is for Daniel. I, I was, I really, I, your presentation was really wonderful and I'm, I'm looking forward to looking at it a little bit more slowly so I can <laughs> really <laughs> absorb it. Um, but I, I have two questions for you. The first is, in the work that you're doing in innovation, what types of technologies have you seen um, or have been working on that really support this cross-sector work that, that Alan just talked about? And then the second question also really goes to the barriers that you've seen in spreading and scaling these innovations. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, I, I think one of the key things is um, you know, just dropping someone with a, a wearable or an app or some smart AI system isn't gonna be the solution by itself. But I think some of the most interesting um, potential is to connect, is to spread access to the pediatric specialist or the nurse practitioner or the nutritionist mm -hmm. or the physical therapist uh, where in whether it's rural, rural Vermont or rural Colorado or other parts of the world, and that can give early access to uh, smart data, whether it's a pregnant woman using an app, and there's plenty of examples, things like Text for Baby that was in, I think Stanford was involved with at some point. Lots of ways to give touch points, and ideally, and back to the, to the challenge point, these aren't one size fits all. You can't give every, every kid a Zigbee or a, every adult a Fitbit and expect them to lose weight. Uh, the user interfaces need to match their age, their culture, their language, um, and so that, uh, if you integrate a system for nutrition, you might be able to start getting low-cost microbiomes on a kid and uh, give, uh, uh, you know, have your Amazon Echo provide smart diet advice to the family. But unless you sort of connect that to their culture, their their economic level, et cetera, it's a bit of a of a challenge. I think um, so. Uh, to the challenge piece, it is about connecting some of these dots and aligning the incentives. I mean, all the way back to something as simple as sending a, a kid or parent home with a connected otoscope. Is the pediatrician going to be able to bill for a digital otitis media exam uh, or not? It's just one small example. And because healthcare is so fragmented and there's so many different systems, it's sometimes hard to prove that it might work in, in the Bay Area where we think everyone has an Apple Watch and a, a smartphone and apply that to the rest of the uh, country. Um, but I think it's an interesting time to start applying these lenses and understanding, back to your earlier points, the, un the unmet need in, in really deep ways. Um, I've been part of Stanford Biodesign where you really focus on the unmet need and then providing solutions, not trying to find a technology and wedge it in. Um, yeah. So that's a brief answer to a longer question. And, you know, one thing I might build on that with, and, and again, it's interesting for this room, is that the value equation needs to be recognized by the payer. And so one of the big challenges with getting any of these solutions out into the market is it's, it's really incumbent upon whomever that payer is. It may be a health system, it may be a pediatric hospital, it may be a, a health plan. And so I think um, one of the things I've been doing for years in trying to bring th these technology solutions into the market has been to really try to work closely with payers and providers to understand what is the value that they want to see and then to make sure that when we're doing the work we're able to demonstrate that value. So whether that's through a randomized control trial or through you know, quicker, more rapid cycle trials. But I think it's, it's, it's really important that we think about as a system, a broad system of care for kids, but also the very specific, to Daniel's point, payers. What is somebody gonna be willing to pay for? And what is the outcome of interest that, that a payer is gonna be willing to pay for? Or how do we develop things that are so low cost, that was the text for baby strategy, that you're not hamstrung by um, you know, long, sales cycle and negotiations. So I think 
they're, they're really, it really is incumbent to some extent on systems and on payers to, to, to sort of step back and say, is there an outcome of interest for us here? Are we interested in seeing kids lose weight? Are we interested in seeing you know, fewer um, admits to the ED for asthma? And, and do we believe that these things can help achieve that? What kind of evidence do we need to see? So I, I do think from a scale perspective answering that question, you know, it's this combination of the market really being a little bit clearer about what it wants to see, and then our ability and our collective uh, work to, to show that these things are actually delivering that value. And I know, you know, what's great, you see a million solutions that Daniel just showed. Each one of those going out to market is, is having to answer that question. And, and bringing new folks in. I mean, back to yeah. Hope Labs, bringing gamers in and data scientists and design thinking all into this process because it's, it's how you, you know, engagement is the big, the new drug, you know, and getting parents and kids engaged and, and uh, not waiting for them to, to be type 2 diabetics at age 12. Um, or if they, looking at that, like they are pre-diabetic, one of the best known digital health companies in the Bay Area is Omada Health. They take folks more on, on the adult side, but pre-diabetics and put them into a social network and give them wearables, et cetera, and turn them around. So for an $800 platform, you save $10,000 in cost the next year. So I think all that can be applied into earlier earlier life. And I think it also, uh, we've sort of implied this, we haven't talked about it straight, in terms of looking at it from the lens of children's hospitals, everything we're talking about for it to work really requires academia, institutions like children's hospitals, the not-for-profit and the for-profit sector to work together in innovative ways, not just the products being innovative, but innovative ways of working together. You've heard some examples of that to really accomplish these things. None of those silos can do this alone. For the kind of innovation we're talking about, all of those sectors need to work together for it really to work well. That's a role that a lot of you in the room, I think, can particularly play because of the varied hats that you wear among you, and some of you actually, the varied hats you wear as an individual. I see a hand back there. Let's put a mic in that hand. No, the, right up here. Yep. The blue shirt person needs to walk forward. Well, but I'll ask the next one. I'm Phil Keyboard from Children's Minnesota. As a pediatrician and a boomer, uh, I think back about summers where I ha wasn't connected to anything and my family didn't know where the hell I was all day. I have a 40-year-old son and, and, and now a, a Z-generation granddaughter. Are we going to uh, deal with an unintended consequence of making our children neurotic? and our grandchildren even more neurotic. Because I watch my kids with monitors and, and Fitbits, and then I'm thinking, oh my god, look at my 13-year-old granddaughter, look at my nine-year-old granddaughter, and now I have a one-month-old granddaughter. I gotta figure out how to get a grandson sooner or later. <laughs> but, but are we gonna create neurotic parents and now even more neurotic uh, grandchildren who end up with OCD and other things? Because they'll have data in front of them all the time. I understand the benefits as a pediatrician, but are there unintended consequences that you guys are worried about? Because it scares me a little. Yeah. Uh, I think the, we don't, we've only had it's kids not. just growing. I mean, uh, I've got a one-year-old, three-year-old, and a 14-year-old, and she just went off to camp where they have no screens for, for three months. So she'll be off Instagram for three weeks at least, but just be good. Um, and uh, my med school classmate, Delaney Rustin, is going to be screen, uh, talking about screenagers, you know, the mm -hmm. impact of some of these technologies in our brands, which I'm often good. My hope is that you don't need to be looking at the data. No one wants to look at your raw steps and sleep data. It needs to be maybe more integrated and matching the individual, almost like a GPS for your health, like Daniel, go right to the gym or the meditation class, not left to the McDonald's, and maybe integrating that early with the right reward systems. So it doesn't become overwhelming data and eroticism, or the hypochondriacs are always looking at their data. It can kind of be guiding you in smart ways throughout the healthcare journey. So I think there's ways to blend the design thinking so it's not data and gadget overload. I mean, I, I think that's clearly a problem, and it's not a, I think, um, I guess the question it sounds like you're asking is, are we sort of exacerbating the problem by creating these, um, these solutions or technologies? And I think, to Daniel's point, what, what, at least what we're trying to do, and I think Daniel as well, is to, is to think about those negative, in, you know, we think about tech for good. There's plenty of tech for bad. So as we're developing and designing thinking about what, what takes someone down the more negative path versus what can help someone move down the more positive path. And one of the most interesting things we've been doing um, is really work both in the early work with Zamzi with the kind of Fitbit thing and the work we're doing now with, with teens in mental health and cancer and with, um, with these young moms 
is just deeply understanding their relationship to technology and what makes them feel anxious and what makes them feel like this is overwhelming and, and driving me in the wrong direction and really taking that seriously into account in the things that we're designing and developing, both from a service and a technology perspective. But it's a big problem. I don't, you know, I think that, sadly, that horse is sort of out of the barn. But I think it's important we recognize the big problem putting on my old NIH hat. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of research that needs to be done to understand this phenomenon. And there is research being done. For instance, the NIH has underwritten a large pro project called the ABCD project that's going to look at basically the developing brain between the age of 9 and 20 of 10,000 kids getting lots of data about their substance use, which is what it was originally designed to be about, but also about their electronics and other kinds of uses to see whether, as some people have theorized, whether in fact this experience of being on the screen all the time actually affects the developing brain. It's an unanswered question. Maybe it doesn't at all. Maybe it does in some subtle ways. So those are the, we need to really understand those things, and we need a lot of research to really inform us, because if we just sort of do it by common sense, we're going to be wrong a fair bit. Important question. Hi. Um, my name's Mara Fleischman. I'm with the Chef Ann Foundation. I had a question for you, Margaret, about Hope Labs. Um, so really interesting stuff you're doing, and I'm interested in uh, the work you're doing with teens, particularly the teen moms and the teens with cancer, and how, what you're finding to be kind of the most important part of getting them to integrate with your tools, and, and ha have you been thinking about um, partnership integrations to help them, to, to get them to integrate with existing tools that are out there? Because uh, it seems like teens are so... Um, you just can't, you can't determine what they're going to click into and, you know, to create something specifically for them almost it turns them around in the other direction. Right. That's a great question. Um, so Hope Lab initially was, was started as a lab that built and developed things. And I came in, I said, two years ago, and I'm much more focused. A lot of the work that I was doing historically was in working with early stage companies. And as I, I may have noted, there are probably 300 early stage mental and emotional health companies out there, and a lot of them are out around us, and we see them and hear from them. So I think a couple things. One, we, we absolutely want, want to work with existing companies and, and try to think about adaptation rather than necessarily starting from scratch and doing a Me Too thing. But second, I think there's a, there's a really interesting question in there as we think about teens and young adults, and we've been looking at this question of where are they? And what platforms are they on? So I've learned a lot recently about things like Twitch. Who, who here is familiar with Twitch? You probably are. <laughs> but I mean, the pl places where, where young people are going, the platforms they're going to, and what we're learning is that they're bringing their issues there. So if they're depressed, that's where they're taking it. And whether that is um, Snapchat, Twitch is a gaming site where they go and watch gamers play games. Um, but whether they're, they're bringing their issues there. And so how are those um, platforms, which are changing all the time. I mean, the one that's popular this month isn't going to be the one that's popular next month. So there's actually a couple of, of early stage companies. There's one called Coco that, um, that actually take the approach of basically building, uh, using AI and using natural language uh, recognition. They basically are building onto existing apps what they talk about as things like, um, you know, emotional intelligence filters. And so how, what do we do when somebody's going to Snapchat with suicidal thoughts? Or what do we do when someone's going to Twitch with their suicidal thoughts? How do we responsibly as society find those and help root those kids to places where they can get help? So I think it, I, I, what I was hearing in your question was this is changing so fast do we actually develop places and expect kids to go there? Are we going to develop a thing about mental health and expect a kid to go there? No. I think what we need to do is think about where the kids are and then try to intervene in ways that are really, you know, em empathetic and, and impactful in those places. So that, that's one approach that we're thinking a lot about. Um, and I think the other is the, the, um, what the teens are telling us is that the um, you know, chat, Dan, Dan talked a little bit about chat bots, but just they're, they're way out here experimenting with whatever the newest thing is. And if we don't work with them as our co-designers, 
we will not be in the right place. So I think that the, the way we've taken that to heart is by really, really working with young people as co-designers in everything we do so that we're not caught flat-footed doing this thing that was hot two years ago. And you, you can probably speak to this. As right, I mean, even um, you know, Facebook, which is so 2015, yeah. can leverage uh, Instagram filters to, to pick up suicidality, et cetera. Now they were even, I spent some time there last summer looking at how to do inter intervention. So I think it's not gonna be any one platform, but yeah. potentially the synthesis of all these and, and applying the, the, the lens of uh, early detection, whether it's for diabetes or mental health issues or what have you to, to intervene early when we need to. But the point that you made um, is a really important one, which is that requires a partnership model. So that if, if that is the case, and I think we believe it is, um, really, really collaborative and par partnerships are gonna need to be created and need to be created between and among people who don't, haven't historically naturally partnered with each other. So I think, again, you know, we're in a room with lots of children's hospitals, really thinking about um, if you want to be relevant in the lives of your teen patients and, and beneficiaries, how do you, how do you make those innovative partnerships in your own communities and kind of more broadly with the, the community that is, that is capturing this part of your teen's lives? Yeah, I think part of what we're clearly talking about is how the children's hospitals innovate in new ways of caring about kids. Uh, when the children's hospitals you all represent were started, it was to deal with acute infectious disease, congenital heart disease, lots of problems that still happen for kids, but luckily, because of the work your hospitals have done, much smaller numbers than it used to. So if they want to continue to be the voice, the leading edge of taking care of kids in the community, it requires a kind of innovative thinking that, again, a lot of your hospitals are already doing about how does the children's hospital lead in terms of these kinds of new collaborations to take care of the current and future health and well-being problems of children, rather than the ones they were founded to do and have done so successfully. In some ways, children's hospitals have worked themselves not completely out of business, but they've taken care of so many of the problems. Uh, it was referred to last night. Some of the things that I saw as a trainee in pediatrics, when I talked to medical students and residents today, they've never seen a case of it because it's just been obliterated. So how do we adjust to the new reality of the challenges of childhood? I think we've got time for one more question. Whoever gets the mic, for, I think I see a mic in the back Hello. And, a hand, and a hand reaching for oh, Hello. I, oh, you beat them. You're already standing up with the mic. Good. It's a tough audience. First of all, it was a great presentation. I'm Kurt Malkoff. I'm, I'm a PhD clinical psychologist from Columbus, Ohio. Technology is terrific. How do we create large-scale human translators that go to the street and deal with Medicaid population, sort of like the Teach for America, where they took very bright college students, they trained them up, they put them in classrooms. We need a new medical profession that chaperones this technology to the 18-year-old mother who doesn't have a clue what an app is, what an iPhone is, what have you. What's going on in that, that space? But I love, I, I hadn't thought about the chap, te technology chaperone. That's a, that's a great, uh, it, often what comes up, when we talk about digital health um, tools, and I talk about, I'm gonna use the Nurse Family Partnership as an example again, because talking to the teen moms, one of the things people say is, oh my God, what an incredible thing. You have a person, you have the human who can actually be out there to both teach and reinforce and engage around the technology. And that's something that many, many digital health companies really struggle with, right? It's engagement. It's how do you actually get stickiness and engagement. So that's one. Two, um, uh, Health Leads, which you'll hear from Rebecca Oni tomorrow, um, has, has been doing this work using, in the Teach for America model, using college students who want to go into health professions to be connecting people with local resources. Technology is a piece of that, not a big piece. There are venture-backed companies that are actually sending community health workers out into low-income neighborhoods. There are a couple of new models in the moment being created. There's something coming out of, a, of Sidewalk Labs that's looking at how do we create a more community-integrated um, program that deals with health holistically that actually integrates technology in a really smart way. So there's a lot of, that, that's a whole other session, which I don't think we have, but there's a lot of really interesting 
um, work going on right now on, I think, what is that very important topic, which is should we expect that, to Daniel's point, these things get plopped down and they just work, or how do we think about, I, I always talk about it as the optimal combination of the human touch and technology, and, and how do we learn more about that? Yeah, I mean, and part of the role that, let's say, the future of the pediatrician is going to be hopefully helping uh, prescribe the right platform and have it match the individual's uh, background. And if I'm, I'm an ENTP or an INTJ, you might need different sorts mm -hmm. of incentives and, and carrots and sticks to keep people on path or to, to change your behavior. So lots of opportunities to blend um, from the psychology, machine learning to uh, the, the sensor piece that we can learn from. And it's going to be interesting, like Google, uh, Verily Health just launched this 10,000 patient uh, baseline project. We don't even know what the baseline is for temperature, let alone uh, behavioral and other mental issues that we can start to integrate and be much more smarter and have a lens to hotspot and, and intervene uh, and pick the right interventions for the right people. Well, I want to thank Daniel, Margaret, and all of you for what I thought was a really both entertaining and very informative and thought-provoking, which I guess is really what we're after, session. It was really wonderful. Those of you who didn't get to ask your questions, don't forget them. Take them with you to the working groups. There are four really wonderful-looking working groups. The problem for some of us is we can't go to all of them, uh, that we'll start. Uh, we're going to have a break now. The working group sessions begin promptly at 10 AM. The locations are listed in your program. If you need any help finding the rooms, there will be Aspen Institute staff all around as they take care of all of our needs, helping us figure out where those rooms are. So we look forward to continuing, really, the themes that were brought up in this over the rest of the morning. Thank you all very much.